Hello, this is Ellie Masters coming to share a free YouTube audio exclusive of Rescuing Melissa. I hope you're enjoying the story so far. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell so you're notified when new chapters come available. Now, let's listen to the story. JEM Publishing presents the unabridged recording of Rescuing Melissa, The Guardian Hostage Rescue Specialists, Book One. Written by Ellie Masters. Narrated by Aubrey Vincent and Matt Haynes. 36. A Hundred Roses. Melissa. Melissa checked, then double-checked the safety bolt, and triple-checked the chair shoved beneath the doorknob. Her phone buzzed with an incoming text. CJ. Hey, beautiful. Melissa. Hi. Miss you. CJ. Miss you, too. I sent you something special. He knew about her past, but still wanted to be with her. Her heart felt as if it would burst. If only Scott wasn't in the picture. She closed her eyes and breathed. It took all her focus not to think. Breathe in. Hold. Count to three. Breathe out. Breathe in. One, two, three. The repetition soothed her nerves. Soon the fluttering in her chest eased as well. Breathe in. Breathe out. Do not think. But her thoughts jumped from Scott to CJ and back to Scott. She yanked her mind's wandering back to the simple act of breathing. Had it been less than a week since she'd met CJ? It seemed like a lifetime. Scott's ugly presence festered. Like a cancer, she couldn't cut him out. In killing that woman, he'd made a statement. He wasn't finished, and he intended to take her back. There was nowhere to go, no one to go home to. As much as this town had turned its back on her, it was her home. Her parents were buried here. If she moved, who would tend to their graves? Even when love or a second chance for love had dared to poke its shy head back into her life, Scott's taint ruined it. Of all the men, all the strange coincidences, how had she fallen for one so intimately connected to her husband's past? So much for not thinking. Melissa focused back on breathing. Perhaps she was one of those women unlucky in love. The first love of her life turned out to be a sadistic killer. The second? Well, she didn't even know how they would ever straighten out the tangled threads of their pasts. CJ's caution about locking herself inside the bedroom seemed overkill, and the television was out in the main living area. He'd be upset, but she was bored. After she found the remote, she flipped through the regular channels. Nothing interested her until she found the pay-per-view menu. She accepted the charges and curled up with a pillow to watch a chick flick with nothing else to do. This time, the flow of tears had nothing to do with her complicated mess of a life. A good, ugly cry had been exactly what she needed as the romantic movie scrolled its credits. She wiped the tears off her cheeks and jumped as a knock sounded at the door. Her heart leaped in her throat. Was it Scott? She calmed herself down. Scott would never be that stupid. It had to be the security detail CJ mentioned. She almost opened the door, but then CJ's orders echoed in her head. Making sure the security chain was in place, she looked through the peephole. Hello? She squinted through the distorted glass, seeing a single figure. Her brows pinched in confusion. CJ had said a team was arriving, but that was a single man. The man's head lifted. He seemed vaguely familiar, although she couldn't say why. Delivery for uh, Melissa Evans? The man held a clipboard in his hands, and a large cart sat beside him. Just leave it by the door. The security team would bring it inside. Are you Melissa Evans? Yes, but I didn't order anything. His easy laughter traveled through the door and relaxed her with the complexity of its tones. Trust me, the delivery is for you. She liked his voice. Rich and full of warmth, a hypnotic quality oddly soothed her. I'm sorry, but I can't accept any deliveries. Can you please leave it with the front desk? You sure you want me to leave them at the front desk? The flowers are from someone named CJ? CJ? Why would he deliver flowers after telling her not to open the door? Wait, he'd said he'd gotten her something. Yes, ma'am. The man turned to the clipboard as if reading a note. There's a card. He leaned close to the peephole. Miss Evans? 
she gripped her phone and shot a text to CJ. Melissa, there's a man outside my door. CJ. It's okay, I sent you something. Melissa, you said don't open the door. CJ. I wanted to surprise you. Don't worry, it's safe. A hell of a surprise, considering she was scared to death about Scott. But she trusted CJ. She peeked through the keyhole and recognized the delivery man from the hospital. I know you. Excuse me? You delivered flowers to me before. Tulips. Her stomach nodded, thinking about the bouquet. I did? Yes, she said. Oh, I remember now. My boss had me come back the next day with a different bouquet. That was you? Yes, you brought roses. He smiled. I thought the name on the delivery slip sounded familiar, but I deliver so many flowers. It's hard to remember them all. An awkward pause followed. Then he cleared his throat. Um, what do you want me to do with the flowers? Melissa bit her lower lip, considering what to do. He deserved a tip for these flowers and the previous two deliveries at the hospital. CJ's rules were in place to keep her safe from Scott, not an innocent delivery man, but she wanted to be sure. She turned back to her phone and sent another text. Melissa, is it okay to open the door? CJ. If they're flowers, I hope you like them. She felt bad for keeping the delivery man waiting. Let me find my purse. I need to get a tip. Oh, no need to tip. I know, but I need to... Hang on. After grabbing a twenty, she undid the chain and turned the deadbolt on the door. When she opened the door, the smile on his face spread ear to ear. He rocked back on his heels, gave a half bow and a grand flourish toward an amazing display of what had to be a hundred roses. Odd that they weren't daisies. Her hand flew to her cheeks as she stepped back. Oh my! CJ had done that? The delivery man pushed the cart inside the room. One hundred long stem red roses. The door clicked shut behind him. A blackish discoloration around his eye drew her attention. What happened to your eye? She remembered him saying something about boxing. He grinned. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It looks like it hurts. She stared at his black eye. He had a handsome face, and it was a shame someone had tried to mess it up. It's nothing. She bent to breathe in the rich aroma of the roses. They smell amazing. I thought you'd like them. Is there a receipt I need to sign? She couldn't keep her eyes off the roses. The blooms filled the room with a heavenly perfume. I can't believe he did this. She was smiling so hard her cheeks hurt. The timbre of his voice changed, turning sour. The roses are from me, my queen. The smile fell from her face at the hardness in his gaze. She took a step back but wasn't fast enough. He lunged, placing her in an armbar and pressed a cloth over her nose and mouth. Pungent fumes irritated her sensitive nasal passages and coated the roof of her mouth as she took in a breath to scream. Her strength faded with that first inhale and disappeared with the next. Her body went limp, and her vision faded black. 37. Sugar and Spice. CJ. Mac and Jenny dropped CJ at the shelter where Child Protective Services had placed Anna and Angela Jones pending foster care assignment. He climbed out of the car. Okay, I'm going to convince these girls to take me through the last couple of days before their mother disappeared. When do you want to meet up? Mac tapped the steering wheel. Shouldn't take us long. Mac and Jenny were meeting with the chief of police and providing consultation services to help coordinate the efforts to track down Scott Patterson. It'll take me a few hours. Once you're finished at the police station, get back to the hotel. I hate leaving Melissa unguarded for too long. Call me when you get there. He felt for his phone in his back pocket. Ah, uh, fuck it. What's wrong? Jenny asked. My fucking phone. I must have left it at the hotel except he didn't remember leaving it in the room with Melissa. You left your phone? The recrimination in Jenny's expression didn't go unnoticed. It wasn't normal for him to be so forgetful. Can I borrow yours? He stretched out his hand, palm up. 
You going to lose mine too? She quipped. Wise ass. I will guard it with my life. Like he should be guarding Melissa. Instead, he had two little girls to entertain and a mother to find. Jenny handed over the phone. We'll be in touch. As they drove off, CJ glanced at his watch. He didn't have much time. A few minutes later, he sat with Anna Jones and her older sister Angela in the playroom, his butt pinched by the hard plastic of a kitty chair. How old are you, Anna? Angela answered his question. Anna's seven. I'm eleven and a half. Anna frowned and stuck out her tongue. Angela crossed her arms and turned away. He gave Anna a wink, which she returned with a brilliant smile. Yes, you most certainly are seven. What grade are you in? She scrunched her chubby face, thinking hard. Then her eyes brightened. I'm in first grade. Mrs. Malone is my teacher. Women loved compliments, as did little girls, and every little girl wanted to be older. He turned back to Angela. You're a wonderful big sister. The bin full of toys kept drawing little Anna's gaze. She squirmed off her tiny seat. I'm gonna go play. Angela answers all the question anyways. She flounced over to the corner and dug through the toys. Angela looked to the corner. Her finger twirled a long, blonde curl. A big sigh escaped her tiny body. He rocked back in the kid-sized chair. His knees nearly met his chin. I can see you're taking fantastic care of Anna. Your mother would be proud. Angela looked sad at the mention of her missing mother. She was trying hard to be brave, but there was a sense of hopelessness in her gentle gaze. And fear. He had to remember these kids had gone from two parents to one, and now to none. She twisted in her seat to watch her sister. Anna had dolls lined up in a row, a beauty pageant of epic proportions underway. Angela shifted again, leaning forward, interrogating him with eyes full of suspicion and distrust. CJ kept his smile relaxed. It must be very hard on Anna, he soothed. She's lucky to have such a brave big sister to lean on. Angela's lower lip trembled. You don't look like a cop. They asked me bunches of questions. She gave him a flat stare. I'm not a cop, and I'm sure you did a great job answering their questions. Her brows lifted. Then why are you here? I'm working with them. I hope to help them find your mother. Her brows pinched and her eyes squeezed shut. He grabbed a coloring book on the table and drew an octopus, ignoring the tears building behind her eyes. When he was done with his drawing, Angela had wiped her eyes. He tapped the tabletop with a crayon. Did you know the police chief knew your dad? She straightened in her chair. My daddy? CJ nodded. Yes, and the police chief knows my boss. I learned all about your dad. He was a hero. No wonder he has a daughter who is so brave. She nodded, but she still wasn't talking. He continued. Did you know the whole police department has been watching over your family because of your dad? Her eyes widened. They are? Oh, yes, he said, coloring in the arms of the octopus. When your mom didn't come to pick you up from school, a lot of people got really worried. They called my boss right away to get extra help. That's why I'm here, but I'm not a cop. He lowered his voice to a whisper, as if sharing a deep secret with her. I don't work like a cop. She paused as if considering the last thing he said. They asked lots of questions, but I didn't know any answers. Her head tilted as she examined his octopus. She pointed to his picture. That's not right. He twisted the drawing. Looks right to me. She giggled. You missed one. One what? Octopuses have eight legs. She counted out each one. See, you missed one. He brought his hands to his cheeks and gave an exaggerated gasp. Oh, no, you're right. He pulled out a blank sheet of paper. Maybe you should help me this time. He spent the next ten minutes drawing an octopus, a whale, a shark, and various kinds of seaweed for them to swim through. Cops ask a lot of questions, he said with a sigh. It's hard when you don't have any answers. Her head shot up. 
and she looked at him with knowing eyes. I have a secret. Do you want to hear it? Her head bobbed. He leaned in, and she moved a little closer. Keeping his voice to a whisper, he said, Many times, when we think we know nothing, we know quite a bit. We do? Oh, yes. He shaded in the shark. But you have to know how to look for the clues. They're there, begging to be found, but you have to know the secret to discover in them. Do you know the secret? Definitely. He placed a hand on her shoulder and gave it a quick squeeze. I'm an expert clue finder. Her eyes widened at his words. A clue finder? Yes. Do you want to help me find clues? He got another nod. Okay. The trick is to try really, really hard not to think about them. Her brows scrunched up. How can you find them if you don't think about them? Well, the cops are awesome, but they weren't asking the right things. No wonder you didn't have answers. Their questions were the wrong ones. You know the right questions? Awe filled her voice. She tucked her hands beneath her legs. They're not questions. They're more like fact-finding tasks. But we have to get out of here to do it right. He pointed to Anna. I want to bring your sister, but I need you to help me watch over her. Do you think you can do that? Another nod. Good. Now, have you ever seen one of those shows where people go back in time? People can't go back in time. We're not really going back in time, but we're going to ride around and pretend it was a couple of days ago. You and Anna can tell me what it was like then. You know, where you went and what you did with your mom. And that's going to find clues? He smiled. It's worked in the past, but only if you believe. If you and Anna pretend with me... We may find the answers we need. Anna brought over one of the dolls. I want ice cream. We don't get ice cream here. Mommy always let us get ice cream. Angela rolled her eyes. Not always. Yes, she did. Every day after the park, we got ice cream. Anna's little eyes misted over. Sometimes he hated his job. He would spend the entire day reminding them of everything they used to do with a mother who was by now likely dead. Oh, I think we can do that. Angela says it's okay if we all get out of this place. He turned to Angela, hoping she would give another of her precious nods. When she did, he continued. We can get ice cream, but we have a mission first. A mission? Anna's expression brightened. What mission? Mr. CJ is going to help us find Mommy, pronounced Angela with the surety of a child. Anna turned to CJ. Really, Mr. CJ? He hid his wince by reaching out and scrubbing Anna's curls. We're going to try. Her sister stood, surprising him with her eagerness. It should have taken a lot more to win her over. Can we go now? If you're ready. He put down the crayons and straightened the stack of drawings. He struggled to get out of the small chair built for bottoms much tinier than a grown man's butt. We're ready. Angela squared her shoulders and jutted out her chin. Let's get you checked out, then. Anna bounced on her feet. We're getting ice cream. Yes, we are, Miss Anna, but only after our mission is complete. If you do a great job, I'll make it a double scoop. She squealed, gripping her hands together. Two scoops? She pivoted and yanked on her sister's sleeve. Did you hear that? Mr. CJ said I could get two scoops. Only if you behave, Angela said. CJ pointed to the corner. Anna, why don't you grab one of those dolls to bring with you? Angela and I will meet you at the checkout desk. He crouched, getting eye to eye with Angela. Are you all right? Her entire body trembled. He wanted to hug her, but refrained from too much contact. Don't worry, he reassured. We'll do our best. She sniffed. I heard one of the cops. She lifted her face to him, eyes pleading. They asked me all kinds of questions, but they never answered mine. CJ sighed. I won't lie. I don't know if we'll find your mother, but I promise to do my very best. That's why you and your sister must come with me. Some of what we do may seem silly or stupid, 
and some things might not even make sense, but it does to me. I need you to trust me. Do you understand? She sniffed and bit her lower lip. Do you think she's... D dead He placed his hand on her shoulder and told the truth. I don't know, but I hope not. 38. Dolls. CJ. Anna returned with a doll clutched in her arms. She tugged at CJ's sleeve. I'm ready. He loved kids. They reminded him not all the world was tainted with evil. He held out his hand, which Anna eagerly took and headed to the door. When Angela didn't move, he stretched out his other hand, coaxing her to join them. She looked at her sister, then tentatively reached out. He gave her hand a little squeeze and a special nod. She returned both. He signed the girls out and loaded them into his new rental car, using the child seats he provided. Now, what did you do Friday after school? Anna told her life's story while Angela remained silent in the passenger seat beside him. Angela concerned him, but he gave her the time she needed to shore up her defenses after their little talk. She had come dangerously close to falling apart. By the time they pulled up to the girls' school, Angela had added to her sister's monologue. Slowly, he was able to piece together the last few days of Henrietta Jones's life. He walked through their home. The girls showed him everything. He asked Angela to play with her sister in her room while he looked through Henrietta's bedroom. Their mother kept an immaculate house, a shrine to her dead husband, and filled every wall with pictures of him and their little girls. He remembered Max saying she didn't have an extended family. Boxes and boxes of Girl Scout cookies were stacked in the study. Anna walked in, carrying a cup filled to the rim with milk. She thrust it out to him. Whoa, CJ said as he rescued the cup from her hands. For you, the little girl said. Mama always said you're supposed to offer a drink to guests. Ah, uh, well, ah, uh, thank you then. He sat on the floor of the study in between the stacks of cookie boxes. You're a Girl Scout? I'm a brownie. Angela's a junior. I was a Boy Scout. You were? Yes, Eagle Scout. He pointed to the stacked boxes. Cookie time, I see. Her eyes lit up. Yes, we were selling cookies before the storm hit. We were supposed to go out on Sunday, too, but Mama took us to the park instead. Then we got ice cream. Mama was real happy. Really? CJ cooed, trying to keep her talking about her memory. He drank from his cup, getting a milk mustache on his upper lip. He pretended like he didn't know. Anna giggled and pointed at his lips. What? You're messy. He made a show of wiping his mouth, dragging his sleeve across his lips and rubbing the milk mustache off his face. Her laughter filled the room, and he was pleased to bring this tiny moment of happiness into her life. Angela wandered in and sat beside him. He pointed to Anna. Your sister was telling me she's a brownie and you're a junior. She said you were selling cookies on Saturday? Angela's gaze bounced across the stacks of cookie boxes and Crash landed on the carpet. She sighed. We did. I'd like to see where your mom sold the cookies. Angela lifted her eyes to meet his. We sold the cookies. Mama just stood on the curb. She didn't talk to anyone. He could see the pride in the firm set of her chin. CJ sipped from his cup. This time he had licked off his milk mustache. Anna giggled. Remember what we talked about? Any little thing can be important. He wasn't sure, but he thought she gave a nod of agreement. Or maybe she thought he was the stupidest adult on the planet. Come, it's almost noon. Let's grab a bite to eat and then you can show me where you sold cookies. Are we going to sell some more? Anna gazed up at CJ with innocent eyes. No, I... He tried to explain the plan for the day, but Angela took over. Typical bossy older sister. We're just gonna drive by the houses. Mr. CJ wants to see where we went with Mama. Get your dolly. We have to bring her back with us. I don't want to go back. Anna whined. Can't we sleep at home? Mama will be back soon, won't she? Maybe. Angela said. Now get the doll. We need to go. He drove the neighborhoods while they guided him, arguing more often than not on where they had or hadn't been. Angela's memory surprised him. 
She knew each street they had visited. Anna chimed in with their sales. He learned all about Mrs. Cleary with her three black cats who bought two boxes of tagalongs. Sergeant Mallory didn't like cookies, but he liked Girl Scouts. He bought a case for his work. Anna remembered because her mom didn't have a case of cookies, and they had to come back. Mr. Blackstone, with the black dog, ordered Thin Mints. Anna proudly informed C.J. that Thin Mints were everybody's most favoritist cookie. Timothy, a high schooler, bought five boxes of Samoas. Anna scrunched up her nose at that because those were the yucky ones. Wow, you two really know a lot about the people you sold cookies to, he said after listening to an in-depth conversation about Mr. Willie and his pet monkey. Mama didn't like us going to strangers' houses, Angela said. She knows lots of people, so we go to their houses. Sounds like a good plan. How does your mother know so many people? Angela shrugged. She's a volunteer? Anna tapped Angela's headrest. Mama didn't know everyone, remember? We went to that other neighborhood? Her voice rose with excitement. They didn't have Girl Scouts of their own. We sold lots of boxes there. CJ's ears perked up. Really? Where is that? Angela's mouth twisted as she tried to remember. They were looking for something out of the ordinary in Henrietta's routine. I'm not sure, Mr. CJ. Tears pooled in the corners of her eyes. Damn. He reached over to pat her knee. It's okay, it's hard to remember things. Did you get on a highway? No. Anna piped up from the back seat. We drove through the fields, you remember? We went past the farm with the rabbits and the goats. It was all farms, except that neighborhood. It's pretty, and next to a forest. Mama pulled in there because the houses were close, and we wouldn't have to walk far. Remember, Angie? Beside him, Angela nodded. He breathed a sigh of relief. Anna, your memory is super awesome. Now how do I find this farm with the rabbits and goats? Between the two of them, they were able to direct him through town. The small development they took him to was on the edge of the city they lived in. He drove around that neighborhood, but they had little to tell him about the inhabitants. No stories of dogs, cats, birds, or monkeys. They didn't even remember who bought what kind of cookies or how many boxes. As they were driving out of the development, they passed a house nestled back against the trees. It looked out of place, until C.J. realized it took up two lots. Anna bounced in her seat. Angie! Angie! Remember him? He bought ten boxes and gave us a fifty! Angela crossed her arms. Yeah, I remember him. What's wrong, Angela? C.J. asked. I didn't like him. You were being a poop face. Anna stuck her tongue out. He was nice, and he gave us extra. Angela shrugged. CJ slowed down in front of the house. It was a nondescript cookie-cutter builder's home. The only thing distinctive about it was how it was set apart from its neighbors by the double lot. The lawn was cut and edged with meticulous precision. The bushes were well-groomed. Flower boxes sat in front of all the windows, and they overflowed with blooms. It looked quaint and inviting, more like an old lady lived there than a man who bought Girl Scout cookies. It made his skin itch. Did your mother talk to him? No, she watched from the curb like she always does. Angela said. That's not true. Anna quipped from the back seat. Shut up. Angela said. He waved and she waved back. Mama did so talk to him. Anna stuck out her tongue again. Shut up, Anna. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're such a baby. Girls, CJ said, let's not argue. The two fell silent. He pulled forward, but stopped to let a white florist's van turn into the driveway of the house. On the way out of the housing development, he searched for an ice cream shop to satisfy the argumentative little girls. 39. Mine. Pierce. Mine. I wanted to dance in the streets and yell it out to the world. My queen, my beautiful queen, was home. My plan worked without a hitch. It was brilliant. I was brilliant. Of course I'd been brilliant. For a moment, I worried she wouldn't open the door. Everything hinged on that one thing. I'd hoped. I'd prayed. 
Can you believe the whole tulip and roses thing? Bless her royal heart, my queen remembered me. I wanted to look my very best for her, too, but thanks to Dickwad, deep bruising circled my eye. Odd how things work out, though. I couldn't have planned for a better reaction. Her sympathy had made my heart flip. When she told me to leave the flowers, I nearly panicked. Thank goodness I had Hero Boy's phone. A few quick texts, and she did exactly as I'd wanted. My window of opportunity had been tiny. My chances slim, but I prevailed. Honestly, today felt like divine intervention, as if God himself smiled down on me. I wanted to linger in that hotel room, but security could have shown any time. Hero Boy could have come back. That freak of a man, Tank, could have been with him. My queen could have roused from the chloroform. Now that I had her, I realized her body did not have the curbs I preferred, but her sleek athletic frame would prove resilient for what she must endure. Once she'd opened the door, she'd been easy to subdue. I liked the way she fought, as pathetic as it had been. The fear rimming her eyes had my dick weeping for more. After the chloroform worked its magic, she crumpled to the floor. Her resistance promised delicious training in the days to come. With my other girls, I used zip ties and duct tape, but this was my queen. She deserved my best. I used two sets of fleece-lined leather cuffs, one for her wrists, the other for her ankles. The locks that came with the cuffs were meant for casual play. I replaced them with the sturdy combination locks I preferred. One, two, three, four, five, six. I always checked my locks. The cart I found downstairs couldn't have been more perfect. There had been a shelf inside, but I discarded that and left it in the hotel kitchen. She'd been so small and light. I tucked her knees to her chest and wrapped her arms round her legs. Chains bound her in position. I even fastened a leather collar around her neck to run the chains through. My heart thudded in my chest. Adrenaline surged. I could feel my excitement in the trembling of my hands and in the shakiness in my gut. In fact, I had a sudden urge to take a crab. You probably don't care about that. That had been the longest drive home ever. I drove five miles below the speed limit. No way I was going to risk a ticket. How would I explain the woman cuffed and bound in the back of my van? I held my breath as I pulled into my driveway and closed my eyes when the garage door opened. I breathed out when the door lowered. Only then did I relax. We were home, and she would never leave. She moaned and tried to move her hands, but her muscles didn't cooperate. Shush, don't fight, I have you. What, what are you doing? Everything is going to be all right. Everything would be perfect. 40. Swing. CJ. Lunch and ice cream pacified the cranky girls. CJ had them talk him through the rest of their last Saturday with their mother and found nothing much happened. Henrietta Jones took her daughters home after selling cookies. She mixed homemade cookies after a dinner of chicken and rice. Yuck on the rice, according to Anna, and gross on the chicken, according to Angela. As a pair, the kids were crushingly adorable. Despite the yuck and gross, he was informed the cookies had been yummy. He walked them through their bedtime routine and finally made it to the morning, where an argument ensued as to who had been the sleepyhead. Once they sorted that out, Henrietta took her daughters to their favorite playground. Anna showed him all the slides and then headed to the swings. Pushing her high enough to get an excited squeal, he scrutinized the playground. So, Anna, where did your mother sit when you girls played? Angela pumped her swing beside them, declining any adult help, and flew as high as her sister. Anna kicked her foot out toward a park bench across the way. She always sits there. Ah, uh, CJ said. Does she sit with friends, other parents, mothers, fathers? Romantic interests who might have stolen her from you? No, Angela said. She read her book. 
The constant laughter of other kids filled the air. The squealing and occasional screams made his ears hurt. He pushed Anna higher. There are a lot of kids here. Interspersed here and there, when necessary, the calming tones of adult voices encouraged children to be nice. Do you play with any of them? We do. Angela gave a vigorous nod. Who did you play with last week? His eyes roamed the playground, looking for anything out of sorts, finding nothing. The whole day had been like this, frustratingly normal. I don't remember, Angela said. We played tag. Anna chimed. Did your mother play, or did she just watch from the bench? She watches, Angela confirmed. I told you, she always sits alone. Irritation rimmed her tone, and her little legs pumped in the air, trying hard to match Anna's height on the upward arc of the swing. Uh-uh, Anna said. Remember? He slowed her swing, interested in this bit of news. You were playing hopscotch with that boy. I told you Mama was talking to that man, the one with the fifties who bought ten boxes. What boxes? he asked. Anna continued, excited to be the center of his attention. Her eyes were bright with the knowledge she knew something her sister did not. Angie said I was being a baby, but Tommy was chasing me. The man told Tommy I was a lady and to stop hitting. He's nice. I like him. I think Mommy liked him, too. CJ pulled out Jenny's phone and sent a text message to Mac. CJ, sketch artist ASAP, lead on case. Wow, you have an amazing memory, Anna. CJ glanced at her sister only to find Angela's hands fisted on the chain of the swing and a scowl planted on her face. He intercepted the outburst. Remember what we talked about? Any detail is important, no matter how small. Angela's gaze flicked to his, and the anger she had been about to direct at her sister melted from her expression. A glimmer replaced it. Not hope. Something else the deepest trust. Angela had said the man had rubbed her the wrong way. She might provide a better sketch than her sister. Angela chewed at her lower lip. Mr. CJ, I need to use the bathroom. He cocked his head. Sure, I'll take you. Her head shook. I'm old enough to go on my own. I'm not like Anna. Okay, please don't be long. I won't. The beginnings of tears pooled in the corners of Angela's eyes. He pretended not to notice and scooped Anna into his arms to carry her to the bench where her mother had sat with the unknown man. He swung Anna in the air and had her laughing and squealing by the time they made it to the bench. Now, Anna, tell me everything about your mom's new friend. Oh, he's nice. Tommy was chasing me, but I ran to Mommy. I was safe, but he tried to tag me. Then he pinched me. He pinched you? C.J. put his hands on his cheeks and pulled a face. Anna giggled. Yes, but he told him that wasn't nice. Tommy? Anna's use of pronouns confused C.J. No, not Tommy. The cookies man? The cookies man? Anna rolled her eyes. Yes, the man who bought the cookies. From the neighborhood? Yes. The problem with interrogating seven-year-old girls was they were seven years old. It was virtually impossible to get a cogent thought out of them. So the cookies man told Tommy to stop pinching you? Yes. She clapped her hands together. He was real nice. And your mother liked him. Anna leaned in and whispered. She was all googly eyes. Ah, I see. Mama didn't remember him, but I did. She leaned in and whispered again. I gave him a big hug. He told me he ate all the cookies. Anna leaned back and gave him a wide-eyed look. I told him that was bad. You're not supposed to eat that many cookies. His mommy would get mad at him. He said he was never good at following rules. No doubt. What else did he say? Anna shrugged. Don't know. Where was Angela? Angie was playing hopscotch with her friend. Hmm. Do you remember how long your mother talked with this man? Nope. CJ's phone buzzed. Mac, sketch artist will be there in five. Hey, Anna, I need you to do something for me. Sure. Her eager eyes lit up, ready to please. 
I have someone coming, and they're going to draw a picture of this man using your description. Have you ever had anyone pull a picture out of your mind before? Her mouth dropped. They can do that? With your help. Angela trudged back from the bathrooms. He lifted Anna off the bench and gave her a slight push toward the playground. They'll be here in a few minutes. Why don't you go play while we wait? Cool. Anna took off at a run. Angela scuffed her heels against the ground. CJ patted the seat next to him. She plopped down. I didn't even notice Mama talking to anyone. CJ leaned back on the bench and stretched his arms out wide. You notice more than you realize. Do you think my mom is with him? He noticed the change from Mama to my mom and sighed. No. Is that what you think happened? The eleven-year-old heaved a deep sigh, appearing much older and wiser than her years. She's been so sad since Daddy died. I saw a note he wrote. He said if anything ever happened, he wanted her to find someone else. Someone to take care of her. I thought if she ever did, she would leave us. I figured that's why she never looked. Then she talks to this man, and now she's gone. CJ put his hand on Angela's head and stroked her hair. Angela, it doesn't work that way with grown-ups. It takes time. So, you don't think... I don't think your mother left. Whatever happened, I'm certain she's trying her hardest to get back to you. I'm here to help her do that. You're going to help me, you and your sister. He told Angela about the sketch artist and what he wanted from each of them. Explaining things helped the preteen maintain a sense of control she needed in her life. CJ was all about fostering that in this young girl who had a lot of growing up to do real fast. Anna was so much easier. She didn't understand what trouble her mother was in. The sketch artist arrived a few minutes later. She was in her late forties, wearing a pencil skirt and silk blouse, sketch pad tucked under her arm. They shook hands and exchanged greetings. Sandra Collins. CJ, he replied. She arched a brow, perhaps expecting more, but CJ liked to keep things simple. Angela, this is Miss Collins, and she's an artist. She's going to ask you to describe the man you sold cookies to. Do you think you can do that? A shrug. I can try. Hello, this is Ellie Masters, and I hope you're enjoying this free audio exclusive of Rescuing Melissa, the first book in my Guardian Hostage Rescue Specialist series. It's a spine-tingling thriller and steamy romance all rolled into one, and I like to think of it as romantic suspense meets Silence of the Lambs. In this week's installment, things are heating up. CJ is being pulled away from the budding romance with Melissa to pursue his kidnapping case. The only question is, will he be able to find the mother of these two adorable girls, before or after something horrible happens to Melissa. We know that her ex-husband is out from prison. He's out there prowling around, and Pierce, a.k.a. Prince Charming, is as crazy as ever. Uh, make sure that you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. You want to make sure you do that so you will be notified when I post new um, installments of this book, which I am planning on doing every Friday until the book is done. I hope you're enjoying it thus far. Until next week. Bye. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Rescuing Melissa, The Guardian Hostage Rescue Specialists, Book One. Written by Ellie Masters. Narrated by Aubrey Vincent and Matt Haynes.